What's going on, everybody? Our guest on this episode of the podcast is a New York native who since childhood has spent countless hours on the ocean. He began his career in fishing aboard charter boats and various sport fish vessels. His first full-time job after leaving the corporate world was aboard the Blue Runner, fishing with world-renowned captain and mentor, Captain Mark de Blasio. After working aboard the Blue Runner, running charters and tournament fishing, our guest took a captain's job aboard a 64-foot Viking, the Five Seas. The Five Seas program spends their summers in New York fishing the Northeast Canyons and local tournament circuit. And in the wintertime, the boat moves to Florida and fishes the Bahamas. Our guest today is extremely passionate about all kinds of fishing. He's incredibly professional, has a positive attitude, and is a great storyteller. We hope you learned something from this conversation and enjoyed as much as we did. Without further ado, please welcome to the podcast, Captain Steve Fernandez. Welcome to the Sea Bros Fishing Podcast, where we follow three words of wisdom. You can't catch them if you don't have a hook in the water. Always trust your instincts. And the last, you'll just have to keep listening. Stay tight. Am I coming off or what? Get that down. Don't get on that rock. Check, check, check. Tricky check. The video will be much better. Our audio will be good. Yeah, our audio will be good. <laughs> there? No. You hear me? We got you. I see. I don't hear him through the. Yeah, no. Because there's no audio out. I hear oh, you. No. Uh, hold on one sec, Steve. Sorry, dude. We're just trying to record differently. So we don't have don't to go on the screen like we were doing before through YouTube. Oh, you guys got the setup over there, dude. I feel like I'm in like Guantanamo Bay with white background over here. I think we're going to be just taking our headphones off and listening to them. All right. I just don't know if there's going to be like an echo with it. Just turn, turn number three mic off. No headphones. Yep. No headphones. Hopefully that works. The last three days of my life, Steve, I felt like, like an electromagnetic pulse with fucking computers. Like... <laughs> It, it doesn't matter what I do, how well educated I am on this shit, slash not educated at all on this shit. I'm just breaking fucking works. something and then nothing works. Yeah. Brutal. I was running at an iCloud nightmare last week. Oh, no. My porn stuff you- got too fucking big and <laughs> my iCloud got filled up pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'll be right back. We'll get started in like two minutes. Taylor, you- Brian's built his coffee. Yeah, I'm in a bit of rain. Oh, how you been? I made a double coffee. Good, man. Good. Um, excited for some more weather. Yeah. Excited to start fishing. Um, yeah. Get back in the groove, you know? Um, I think everyone should have made it up there this busy. The traveling. I usually never travel, but it's been a crazy winter. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing we'll have to make sure we do when we're chatting back and forth, I can definitely tell there's like going to be like a lag of audio. Yeah. There's about a one second lag in between us talking and you talking. So 
just take like one extra breath before before you say anything. You just start talking. I don't know why Zoom does it, but like keys in on voices and then it cancels everybody else's voices out. But gotcha. Got you. But you hear me all right? You see me yeah, all right? Yeah, you sound you sound great. Wait. We just came back from Castafari's seminar and it was a good time. Um no. Steve White's no, I see a couple. Oh, this whole freaking audio stepping on things brutal. Is, is there like a selection for that? You ask me the questions that I don't know. No, I was just wondering. I don't fucking know. Okay. Um, hold on one sec here. I don't know why it's cutting out so fucking bad. Are you are you using the microphone on your laptop or are you using ear pods or anything? In my straight phone. You just using your phone? Do you have ear pods or anything? Or or just no, like them? You don't? Okay. You might. Oh, that... Um do you have like just the regular headphones with a microphone on the uh on the wire? Like, um noise canceling ones. I don't know if that would work though. All right. Um that's what it is, is the iPhone doing this. It's because of his distance from the mic is what it is. It's taking that much time to receive the information and process it through. Uh, really? Yeah, because when you sit closer to it like that, it's definitely much better. Really? That's yeah, crazy. Okay. Immediate. Yeah, Immediate. yeah Immediate the view's right better there. too. So if you can like somehow prop it up or whatever, slide yourself closer, it's definitely get, picking up the mic a lot better. All right, let me see. A little better? Like a million so times better. better. A million times better. Yep. Let's put it inside into my just. <laughs> yeah, just swallow your iPhone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, hold on one sec. Speaker view. So it's recording right now. Mm -hmm. Is it recording as two separate frames or do i need to switch the speaker view you think well it's, he'll be the main yeah obviously and i think it's recording as you're seeing it right now okay so you don't really need to see us as much obviously i think you might be able to stretch the corner though <coughs> oh, sorry there you go look at that perfect don't know if that's going to do it, but we'll find out. Uh, gallery speaker view is on. I know we have just been. Now, here's a question. When I was signing in, it asked me if I wanted to use Wi Fi or, or dial in. Should I dial in instead? Could that have a difference in the audio? I don't think so. It's going to be. It's whatever your your mic is on your phone. Dial in. I would think Wi-Fi would be better. I think Wi-Fi would be better. It sounds much better yeah. now. Um, but yeah, try to like get up close and personal as much as you can with your phone. Get yourself comfortable though, because it's you know obviously gonna be a you know an hour and a half just shooting the shit, but if you can get yourself like as close to your phone as possible, the better. Better. That's better. That's perfect. <laughs> so how was Belize? Dude? Oh man. Fucking Belize was awesome. Um, I never really travel. Um, you know, usually I'm busy in the winter with the boat. We usually do the Bahamas thing. Um, but the past two years, my boss, he loves traveling. So when COVID hit, that was like the kiss of death for him. So we couldn't really travel. So the past couple of years, um, the whole winter he's been traveling. So as opposed to us bringing the boat down to Florida, you know, we usually did like Harbor Island, stuff like that in the Bahamas. Um, we've been actually keeping it in this place called Director. Uh, it's in Mamaroneck on the Sound. And it's a giant shipyard um, and they got us inside in a heated shed. Um, so I've been able to travel the past couple of years, which is cool. 
you know, I get a lot of work done with the boat during the winter since it's all temperature controlled. But um, yeah, in the time off, I was able to go away with my wife, which was awesome. Belize was sick. Um, you know, I've never been, we went there as kind of just a vacation for us, but I obviously did some fishing, snorkeling, diving. It was awesome. One of the best places I've ever been. That's definitely a bucket list trip for us. Yeah, I'm jealous. The inshore fishing epic. So, you know, I really didn't go with the mindset to offshore fish. You know, it's all I do here. So I kind of wanted to do something different. Um, we stayed at an awesome resort right on the beach. I brought like a little travel rod with me and the bone fishing was insane. Um, I figured I caught somewhere like a hundred bone fish right in front of the hotel. That's unreal. You know, Dude, it was like, people didn't believe me. You know, I'd walk down with the wife, we'd get a drink, we'd hang out by the beach, and I'd flip cast out, you'd see them at your feet, and it was, I never caught bonefish before. Um, definitely super fun. They fight like crazy, and cool experience, you know, just being somewhere else, doing a different kind of fishing, not like on a charter or a guide, kind of just like figuring it out on my own. Um, it was sweet, man. It's For nice. Sure. It's definitely nice to completely break outside of your program sometimes and just truly enjoy it and figure it out in the moment. I feel like you get so caught up in your rhythm and your system. It's like it's like a nice reset. Like, it's like fun again. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Not that it's not. Back, fun, no, but it's, it's like it's like going back. You know, when you're a kid, you're just trying to like discover it. You know. Yeah. Figure it out. Oh, what it was, you know, like uh, I had a buddy that went there, recommended the place, but I'm not like, I don't like, you know, staying in line, doing everything. I like exploring, going to find my own place. And, you know, we rented a golf cart and we just zipped around the island. My wife would be driving the golf cart. I'd be like hanging on the top, <laughs> looking for bone. <laughs> um, it, it was awesome. You know, that place, Ambergus Key is nuts you know it's i think it's home to the second biggest barrier reef coral reef in the world behind yeah. the great barrier reef um so it has that like ocean side with the reefs and beautiful snorkeling but it also has like a mangrove side of the island um which is all like knee deep water and the first day we get there i'm driving around the golf cart with my wife and you know i see these bonefish i'm seeing snook i'm like oh this is I'm going to grab my rod. I'm going to, you know, walk around in the mangroves. You stay here. <laughs> <Hold on. laughs> yeah. But I, I, my wife is the best. She's down for exploring. You know, a lot of people like just sitting by the pool. You know, we hop in the golf cart, look around. We're like hiking through the woods. But I was telling her, I was like, listen, you know, maybe you go back to the pool. I'll walk around in the mangroves for a couple hours. Literally five minutes after I say that, I'm like what the hell is that i look in the water it's like a 10 foot saltwater croc <laughs> my friend <laughs> he forgot to mention that to me um so i'm like all right there goes my waiting plans for the day but oh god um, yeah, all the crocs there it was definitely experience those things are no um, joke yeah that was, that's like one animal that scares me i can deal with snakes but crocodiles yeah, like just like the the death fucking spin thing where they just rip things like limbs off and yeah. stuff. Yeah, I'm good. I'd yeah. rather die from poison. Yeah, you know. Be like, animals don't bother me. You could put a bear in my house, a shark, anything. The <laughs> one thing that bothers me is spiders. That's Brian. And literally, right here, pal. The same way, I I feel your pain. Day one, we're walk, we're driving the golf cart. And from like 50 yards out, we're on the trail. And I'm like, look at that fucking crab walking across the street. I see it from so far next to it. It was a giant black tarantula with a oh. red. This is day one. I'm like, oh, my God, what have I done? We chose so <laughs> and like, as I say that, I actually whole thing on video i think i might have posted on instagram but uh as i see that another golf cart's coming and i'm like waving them i'm like listen this is a giant spider out this lady jumps off her golf cart she was from the states takes her sunglasses off 
and starts poking the spider like across the street like oh come on buddy you know get off the street i'm ready to like get back to the plane and fly home like right around in the corner yeah. he's driving he's got his hands <laughs> up this lady's like come on little fella i could do that i can totally picture it uh -oh. amazing and it bothered me like to the core so that was like how I started my vacation. Thankfully, I think we only saw one more, but dude, one I, more. Than, like, yeah, one is too many. I was in Hawaii for uh, our my wife and I were in Hawaii for our honeymoon, and we get back from we fished and then you know did a cup did something after fishing. We were cooking mahi at the house, had supper. It's like eight nine o'clock at night. And uh, we're putting dishes away. And she opens up this lower cabinet and like puts a pot in there and then kind of closes it. As she's like staring in the cabinet as she's closing it. And I'm looking at her. I'm like, something's not right here. She goes, I'm going to show you something, but you have to you have to promise not to freak out. And I'm like, all right. No. She goes, look in the cabinet and. I open it and on the back of the cabinet, there's a cane spider, like the size of my hand. And I'm just, so I, I open it, I close it and kind of freak out. And then I do like the second peak and the fucking thing's gone. <laughs> uh, I was about to say. Yeah, it's gone. It's, it's, it's gone. And, then, and, uh, and we're like about to jump in bed and I'm like, I'm not fucking sleeping for the entire rest of this trip. Like I was waking up every half an hour, like looking under my sheets, like making sure he wasn't under there. Oh, it was horrible. They're, they're like, they're harmless. You know, talking to the locals and stuff, they're harmless, but they're huge, like small body, big legs, terrifying looking. Not for me. <laughs> not for me. Yeah. I actually been a big, uh, I grew up a lot as a human this winter. Um, as literally as I was leaving for Belize the day of, uh, I have a friend who runs a private boat also. Um, and uh, the owner of his program, they he owns a lodge in South America. So they call me, they're like, oh, you know, we're, we're shooting down to the lodge in Colombia. I was like, oh my God, that's so awesome. And they're like, do you want to come? I'm like, when are you going? And it was like two weeks out. Um, basically, I had my Belize trip, I landed in the States. And then I'd have to fly back out like four days later. Um, it was once in a lifetime. So I said, sure. So basically I did my Belize trip. You know, the bone fishing was insane. The snorkeling was insane. Um, I landed in the States. I kind of got my stuff together. And then I hopped on a flight to Medellin in Colombia. Um, and again, I usually don't travel much. I'm usually doing boat stuff in the winter. Um, but this was a special situation. So round two in the jungle for me um i hop on this plane i get to medellin my friends get there um the next day we fly out to the jungle it's uh, actually a place called black sands fishing black sands lodge what i mean belize was cool but this was like a totally different experience we landed in the jungle um it was like an hour flight from medellin basically to pablo escobar's little cocaine airport in the jungle on the beach um literally like you know he made the town 30 years ago whatever it was um and we hop on a panga and now we're on this panga and i'm looking around and there's like little pangas everywhere and then there's a 39 contender with like trip 450s i'm like oh that's definitely the boat we're going to <laughs> um we go out yeah, we spent five days in the jungle, not a road, not a trail. The only way to get to the lodge is by Panga. And it was one of the coolest experiences ever. Like five-star meals, beautiful lodging, beautiful rooms. But in the jungle, you see crazy stuff. I mean, <laughs> we saw spiders the size of my hand um day literally day one we go fishing we catch a bunch of yellowfin a bunch of groupers we come back and we're like listen let's just take a walk on the beach and i am comfortable on any beach in the world doesn't matter where i am as long as i'm near the ocean i'm fine 
uh, my buddy, who's the captain of that, uh, that private boat, he's from Virginia. So he doesn't mind trees and walking around. So I'm like hanging on the beach. He's like, oh, let's go into the jungle a little. I'm like, eh. <laughs> whatever, live a little. So we walk in the jungle and he's a little bit ahead of us. I'm next to his mate, uh, my buddy Blake. And out of nowhere, I like hear Blake moving and I look and he's doing this. And in my brain, I'm like, yo, he just walked into a spider web. <laughs> It was so big that you literally heard the web breaking. <laughs> I almost didn't even talk about it. It traumatized me. I look over and it was a fucking spider this big, face level with him. He didn't make a single noise. He like ripped the web. I hear it snapping. That's how big the thing was. And he walked away. We, I ran onto the beach 100 miles an hour. He comes out. I'm like, dude, I'm like, I can't believe you just handled that the way you did. I would be on that manga on my way back to the airport. And I guess for a week, like, I got used to seeing these giant spiders. And it's, it still gives me a little nightmare. But the absolute worst one you could see, which is they call it the bird eating spider. Oh, fuck Literally. No, no. no. <laughs> if that thing is eating the, anything bigger than an ant, I, I don't wow. want to be anywhere near it. I literally thought it was going to pick me up in the web, roll me up in the tree, and like <laughs> store me away. Um, but yeah, I a bird eating spider. And oh. I grew a lot. Like I said, like I'd get in the sheets at night and, you know, housekeeping would have the sheets tucked in and I would leave everything tucked, like wrapped around my neck, like staring <laughs> all night. Um, and then by like day five, I was like, so <laughs> I get used to things like that, surprisingly. I mean, I mean, I can definitely see that at least, you know, you're probably not afraid of like daddy long legs and stuff anymore, I'm sure, after those experiences. He said when I got home, I was like, anything we've ever come across in the Northeast, I'm fine with now. Like, it's amateur hour compared to in Columbia. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that's awesome. It, well, experience. I had to cool. take advantage of it. Oh, yeah. I mean, any opportunity to go anywhere, travel, you know, especially like live the local life anywhere. It's pretty cool. You know? Sick. Um, that was, that's awesome. So I'm sure you've listened to a few of these. We really kind of have a casual format. We'll, uh, we have some kind of fish nerdy tactical questions that we'll ask throughout this. You know, you do a lot of Canyon fishing and, um, you post a ton of great content. It seems, I mean, we know you through others and, we follow you on uh, on social and you're very professional and, you know, it seems like your program is uh, is awesome. It's it, it seems like you have a great owner, crew, captain relationship. Yep. And uh, do you want to kind of just go through what the yep. five C's program is all about? Like you can even do like a just a quick like how you got to the five C's program. Obviously, you grew up into fishing and then just explain what it's like now and what your how last season went and what you're looking forward to this next season. Yeah, for sure. So basically, um my story is kind of a little different, you know, like most people I grew up since you know, I was 2 years old I lived on the beach. Uh, my family had a summer house in Breezy Point, um which is like Rockaway Beach area. And since I was 2, I was in the water. I was fishing, I was snorkeling, you know, I take like broomsticks, tape a fork to it and <laughs> spearfish in front of my house. Like ever since the beginning of time, that's all I wanted to do. Um, wound up going to school, went to college, did that whole thing, graduated college. All I wanted to do was make a ton of money. Um, like a lot of people do when they graduate. I wound up getting a job in Manhattan. I worked at Yahoo for a couple of years in the city. Um, did that whole corporate thing. Um, and it just wasn't for me, you know, like I wake up every morning, I had a great job, 
you know, I would have been set forever. But I wake up every day like, why am I miserable doing something that I'm going to be doing 75% of the time for the rest of my life? Um, and I had some friends that were into fishing full time. Um, and actually kind of my mentor, uh, Mark Blasio, um, had some conversations with him and just out of nowhere, I was like, listen, if you ever need a guy, I don't need any notice. You know, you don't have to pay me. I just want to do it for the experience. You know, I know people throw messages out like that, but I was serious. Like you could call me anytime. And all I want to do is learn. Like I live for this stuff. So really didn't think anything of it. Um, this was in like September, a long time ago. December rolls around. I think it was the beginning of December. And I get a message from Mark, like 10 at night. He's like, hey, can you be in Boston in five hours? I'm like, look at my well, mic. It's five and a half hours away. I'm like, I can't make it. He's like, what about Montauk in nine hours? I was like, done. So I had a friend pick me up middle of the night, drives me to Montauk. I had never met Mark before. Um, it's me and my friend, Eric and Mark pulls up on a boat. You guys might be familiar with Jamie's toy. Yeah. Um, I was actually, I was just out of all cheese and the new one was right next to us. What a beautiful boat, man. Unreal. Ronnie knows how, to, um, but his old one, which was, I mean, the original gangster down his boat that I've been on, you know, um, totally fish boxes galore. I mean, the boat was rigged, set up perfectly. So I pull up and it's Mark and Dean Lambros. Um, so I'm like, all right, we're in good hands here. I hop on the boat. It's the middle of the night. Get out of Montauk. We put it at eight knots. I'm like, yo, so what are we doing? You know, it's December. And he's like, listen, we're going to go catch some fish. And was he right? I think by the end of the trip, we were green sticking, did some night chunking. I think we ended up with 21 giants anywhere from like, I think it was like 71 inches just under to I think around 80 was the biggest. Um, four big eyes, eight yellow fin and a long fin. Um, so we caught like a two lamb in December in the Hudson you know, when it was going off and that was kind of my first experience. And, you know, I became friends with Mark, um, went back to work, you know, I was kind of just always kicking around the idea of leaving. And I think it was like a year later. He's like, listen, when you're ready to leave, I got a job for you. So I'm like, all right, started talking and basically I left my job and that was the year that we, he started Blue Runner. Mm -hmm. um, so he'd left the chart he was in, you know, um, they had a 60 foot Richie blue runner. And in the beginning of the year, he's like, listen, you know, we're going to do like 10 trips, 10 charters. Um, and the rest of the trips will be like private trips with the boss, stuff like that. I think year one, we wound up doing 40 charters. So he told me, you know, yeah, you'll have weather breaks, go home, see your wife, girlfriend at the time. The first weather day we had was August 29th. It was like <laughs> weather for three months, working like, I think I lost like 20 pounds at the time. Um, but yeah, that's really how I got my foot in the door. Um, what a you know, great, thanks to what, Mark. A great, what a great guy to get your foot in the door with too. You know, he has just decades of experience out there. It's pretty incredible. He's the man. And all the times I spent with him, you know, I spent time with a lot of different fishermen. In my eyes, he's the best, man. He just his insights, you know, and the things he taught me how to look at things differently outside the box. And, you know, it just applies to everything. And, mm. you know, he's really good at what, and, you know, we had a great year that first year. You know, we did 40 something overnights. I think we won like three out of the four tournaments we were in or placed. Um, did two TV shows in that time. Um, yeah, really just got the name out there. We started that group Waterproof, which is kind of like an Intel seminar group, um, which has been going on, I guess, now for eight years. Wow. Still to this day, 
it feels great like, group. Yes, and, I know, it feels it like it was that. yesterday. That's insane. That is insane. I say the same thing. I mean, this was 2015 and it feels like I've been doing the five C's thing for a couple of years. And this is, this is my eighth year on the boat, same crew. So basically, you know, that all happened, kind of got my name out there in the fishing world and had a friend of a friend who reached out and said, Hey, those nice guys buying a, uh, a big Viking and looking for a younger guy, you know, good with people, good with fishing. And that's kind of how I got my job with my current boss. And my current boss is the man, you know, I've seen all different programs with, you know, just people getting treated like crap. And my boss is the most down to earth. He's like a friend on the boat. You know, he's a lot of these guys don't like doing anything, you know, like we'll get whatever, double triple of big eyes and we're all running around my mates running around i turn around my boss is there with the saws all cutting the heads off dressing fish i'm like oh my god this is amazing um so as far as like how my boss is and the crew they're awesome his friends are awesome and it's kind of like every time we go out it's like a guy's trip you know it's very casual you know we this is our eighth year together so we kind of all know you know each other and it's uh it's a really cool thing i feel super lucky and you know the program i'm in he loves tuna fishing he loves fishing um he has two young sons and a daughter they've all caught tuna you know jigging popping and the sons love it you know they love doing the overnighters and it's awesome man i, I have no complaints it's my boss is uh the man that's cool. So you're ready to go back to Yahoo is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Listen, it's, it's different. It's it's not for everybody, you know, like um, just like the corporate thing is it's not for everybody. But, you know, it's definitely a different lifestyle, you know, kind of being on call, not really knowing, you know, the weeks ahead, what's going on, everything being weather dependent. But, you know, eight years in, I wouldn't change it for, for anything in the world. Do, awesome. do you think yeah. your do you think your previous corporate life and working for a big company like that helped you going into running your own program and helping you kind of be independent with the boat and working with the owner, family, customers, that sort of thing? Yeah, for sure. You know, like the jobs I had were early sales. So in a sales job, it's not like you show up as like, you know, a janitor or you know, a control like where you know, hey, I do this, this, and this today. Tomorrow, I do this, this, and this. With sales, it's different. You're kind of running your own company, you know, making a name for yourself and being good with people and networking. And I mean, those three things right there, you could transfer right over to fishing, you know, networking, being good with people, you know, running your own kind of business and brand. Um, it definitely helped me, you know, it's all. It's all like life experience. And, you know, speaking of experiences, that's kind of why I went away from it. Like in the beginning, it was all money for me in the corporate world. It's all I cared about. Like, I want to make money. I want to make money. When I, once I started making money, it's like, do I really care about money when I'm miserable? You know, just not happy. I mean, you guys know better than everybody. Those experiences you get, like, you know, getting an 800 pounder or just fighting a fish or five, that feeling you get when you land that fish, you turn around high fives, cracking beers. Like that's like what I live for. You know, those, those feelings you get to me, like that's life, you know, like I don't Understood. care about them. You get money to try and be happy. If this is the happiest I ever am and it has nothing to do with money, like, you know, it kind of tells you something there. Yeah, thousand percent. I'm. I have a similar. We both we have both similar have transitions. You know, like basically. we both went to maritime. We did the corporate thing, working for different companies, and you know, we always were chartering and working with the family business and all that. You know, part time and full time in college. But it it came to the point like I was thirteen years in before I made the pivot back, and it was just like the same exact feeling. But I, I don't know. It's 
I think it's, you know, it's not for everyone and not everyone takes that path, but I'm, I'm glad that I did. I mean, it, it just makes the whole running the business side of the charter company kind of feel like it's not that difficult in comparison to working for some huge corporation, you know, and then you can focus on those, you can focus on the relationships, you can focus on the fishing and your instinct and, you know, developing as a fisherman, you know, you know, it just takes the pressure off from, from the other side of things, I think anyway. Yeah. I, mean, sure. I think it makes you excited when those moments happen, mm. you know, like you just said, you get an 800 pounder and you turn around, you're high fiving. And it's like, you look, then you look back and you're like, I could be sitting in the office freaking doing paperwork right now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, yeah. it, it's savage. Really. We're honestly, we all have like the luckiest, life yeah yeah oh. you know and i i tell people all the time like there's a flip side and you guys know you know people watch your videos like oh my god you know every day they're posting a video getting bit in some crazy end game video you know but like even though it's awesome there's a reason you get paid to do it you know there's the behind the scenes the rigging the nightmares things going wrong with the boat like People always say you have the coolest life. I kind of always imply like on Facebook, it does seem that way. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I'm not going to post a video covered in diesel at two in the morning, 80 miles off with, you know, all the engines off trying to figure out what's going on. But that's what makes those moments even better. You know, knowing that what you have to go through to get to that point, you know, people see just the, on social media, stuff like that. But a lot goes into it. You guys know, you know, every day, maintenance, fixing things that are broke, you know, things on the fly and, you know, makes those moments sweeter. And like you said, you know, going to maritime, having that experience in the corporate world, it's all life experience, you know, and it applies to everything, whether it's fishing, whether it's sales, you know, whatever it might be, it's yeah. it all accumulates and, you know, adds to the experience. For sure. So kind of uh, going off this, what what's like your yearly program? Like how from start us from January on, like what does five yeah. do and what do you do personally? For sure. Uh, so the first six years, you know, did the standard thing, brought the boat down to Florida. You know, we we tried to hang out late. You know, we had some good trips. Uh, with the owner in like November or December to the Hudson, you know, bluefin stuff like that. So I was always kind of a late leaver. We'd leave in November. And one year we left, it was negative four. I think we made ice all the way to beach. <laughs> and I have closure on the back of the boat. I don't have, you know, any heat or anything in the bridge. So it was just like dress and pray. Um, but that was like the first six years. We did Harbor Island a lot. I made some great friends down there, learned a ton about Bahamas fishing, Wahoo, keep dropping all that stuff. Um, but like I said, since COVID hit, boss loves traveling, so he's been all over the place. Um, thankfully, I have some nice friends that hooked it up, and you know, the boat is in a heated shed, um, which for me is huge because now I have a boat that's in a 70-degree shed. I could paint engine rooms. I could do into you know, whatever – people really can't do in the Northeast during the winter, I have the ability to do. Um, so, you know, starting in January, January is kind of, you know, I try and do like a trip, a vacation. Um, but yeah, now starting in February, you know, engine work, painting the engine room, you know, a lot of finishing work, cleaning up. Um, and as you guys know, tackle, you know, redoing spreader bars and skirts making leaders and it really is kind of never ending when it comes to the tackle you know getting real service breaking down rods and you know having the boat temperature controlled is huge for me you know four out of five days i'm up there you know doing stuff and um also like with paint work and bottom jobs and stuff like that i don't have to wait for nice weather you know a lot of times these boat yards in april they're scrambling everybody's trying to get everything going you know 
we have a nice winter, I get everything taken care of. Um, so that's kind of it with the winter work. Um, starting in, say, April, um, I start looking to splash the boats. Uh, my boss has the Viking, the 64, five C's. He also has a 31 regulator. Um, so, you know, same thing with that, you know, try and get whatever I can done in the winter. And our season starts pretty early, like in the New York bite down here by Rockaway. So we have amazing striped bass fishing starting in April. Um, so we kind of get on the grind with that you know, start with stripers and sea bass. And then my boss loves sea bass fishing. He loves eating sea bass. So we do a lot of that. And then the tuna starts showing up and, you know, we get into that grind. Um, so for say from like April to July, I'm usually here West end of Long Island Rockaway, you know, we fish the Hudson stuff like that. So usually my boss ends the month of july in europe um so again it gives me some time to get everything in order but uh last year he did something interesting um he did like a little trade with his friend um so his friend while my boss was traveling in july basically used the five c's he entered uh the tri-state and the canyon challenge in montauk and block um so basically my boss is gone his buddy enters these two tournaments. I get to fish the two tournaments. You know, the boat stays moving. Um, and the winter, his friend let my boss use his yacht down south. So it was kind of like a trade-off for them. Um, work both for them and for me. You know, I stay busy. The boat's moving. And, um, yeah, we got to fish uh, those two tournaments this year. And, you know, did pretty well. Um, we placed in the Canyon challenge, won some money, um, and in the tri-state great fishing, sick fishing, but we didn't place, um, but a uh, fun time nonetheless over there. Fishing overall in the canyons. How was it this year? Unbelievable. Um, I want to say in the first six trips, um, we averaged 50 yellowfin a trip, um, yeah, which is like insane, you know, but a lot of people ask me like, oh, you know, all, all these crazy trips, we were running far. Um, we were fishing hydro, welker, you know, beach at the least. Um, for you guys, I don't think that's that terrible of a run, but for us, it was, we were doing between. 145 and like 163 wow. uh one way every trip each is uh, like 150 ish for you guys yeah i would say beach is like 140 um from shinnecock um you know hydro further 165 ish i believe um but just the fishing out there was on another level um and i tell people it's you know, just like the nature of the beast, like the way the Gulf Stream works, though, you know, the eddies, they spin off hydro. I mean, they're so, you know, hot, like they're right there off the stream. Like these fish come in, they're so horned up, you know, they've never seen a boat, they've never seen, and the fishing's insane. You know, anybody that goes out there knows it's, it's incredible. I mean, compare it to like Panama, you know, I mean, you pull up. You get the right water, the right change over there. And I mean, there's videos and just yellowfin airing out as far as you can see. Big eyes airing out. And, you, you have know, the fishing was just. Some, you have some really insane footage. Some of the hand feeding stuff yeah. you have is ridiculous. The underwater stuff is insane too. So that kind of like went hand in hand. The yellowfin fishing out east was mental. You know, any boat that was out there was killing them. Um, and that kind of transferred in, you know, the fish moved in, they moved to the east, uh, excuse me, to the west. You know, guys started getting them like West Atlantis. And I'm sure you know, they pushed inshore. A lot of guys were catching a lot of yellowfin inshore, you know, like midshore grounds, shipping lanes. Um, and same thing, the fish kind of follow the squid, you know, so they follow them from the canyons, the squid move inshore, the tuna followed them. And 
that resulted in some, I hate to use the word, I know a lot of people say it, but epic. Like, I mean, the fishing behind the draggers, you saw some of the videos. I mean, we caught multiple yellowfin tuna on ice cream sandwiches. Like, <laughs> Dude. <laughs> yellow ice cream sandwiches. We were just emptying the bait freezer. Yeah, I mean, that fishery's been nuts the past couple of years. You know, those yellowfin get behind those squid draggers. And, you know, I, I befriended a few of the guys, which is cool. So I get some cool intel. But they tell me stories about them, you know, pulling up uh, a haul and yellowfin just smashing into the bag full of squid, like face first, just sucking squid out of the net. Um, it was nuts, man. Yeah, we had trips where... You could have called hundreds. I mean, we spent a couple hours just feeding them, you know, pop chips and anything else we could think of that went in the water. I mean, they ate it and it was, uh, it was some incredible fishing, man. Can you walk us through like your daily process of fishing with yes. feeding um, these elephant and finding the draggers and all that? Is it as easy as just finding a dragger and throwing bait in? Or are you doing? How much I, I wish I could. we went on the third corner of the dark moon with the current. Yeah. One fish find these draggers. It's, it, you know, it's, it's easy to catch them. You know, there's definitely an art into keeping them around the boat, you know, knowing whether or not this boat has 10 fish under it. And if you throw 50 pounds of bait, those 10 fish are going to eat your baits a hundred yards behind the boat. You'll never know they're there. Or is there 20,000 fish and you could shovel bait over and they eat it as fast as you shovel it off. Um, it's really just finding the right boat. You know, there's really no secret to it. Um, you know, pull up to a boat. The one thing with these guys is with these commercial guys is you got to respect them. You know, if you pull up to a boat and they're cursing you out and, maybe find a different track, <laughs> you know, don't push the envelope too much. Um, but a lot of them are super nice. You know, we hook them up with, you know, drinks, food, beer, you know, whatever, whatever they need, but just respecting that these guys are doing it for a living, you know, we're out there, you know, again, doing it for a living, but you know, this is their livelihood. So as long as you respect them, you know, I've learned they give the respect right back. Um, just being safe. You know, knowing what you're looking at when you pull up to a dragger, you know, a lot of times they have two lines in the water, the two cables um, pulling their nets. And, you know, some of the bigger boats, the more modern boats, you'll see like a third cable coming from up top. And so a couple of situations this year where guys that weren't too familiar didn't see that third cable. And to my understanding, it's a camera to keep an eye, you know, um, on their nets when they're full stuff like that. So knowing how to approach them, you know, without getting in any trouble or causing any unsafe situations for the most part, it's literally back right up to them, shovel it off and wait, you know, like you'll see them within five seconds, 10 seconds if they're there, you know, and once you see them, it's start firing baits in the water and keeping them around the boat. You know, making sure throwing enough bait to keep them interested, not throwing too much that, you know, they wind up going down current. Um, you know, there's kind of a little art to it, keeping them around, keeping them around, boat, keeping them interested. Um, but for the most part, when they're there, man, it's as good as it gets, there. you know, and um, a lot of boat traffic. So you got to deal with that. Um, one thing we kind of, you know, started doing, which again, my boss is super cool and he was down with it is taking advantage of like our water line, you know, like we're a 64 foot boat. We have two sea keepers. I mean, let's go when it's five foot, you know, let's go when it's blowing 2025. And, you know, we did that a couple of times this year, went out there on like eight footers, you know, those commercial guys, they don't go in in that kind of way. So a couple times we went out there and had the whole place to ourselves. 
you know, pull up to one boat, one shovel off, and we never move the boat for the rest of the day. You know, so that was uh, one of the advantages of having, you know, a big boat um, is getting out there when, you know, there's not too much competition. Yeah. Which it makes a difference. All yellowfin. Um, we had a couple bluefin mixed in. Um, this was all you know, 30 to 40 fathoms, the squid boats. Um, and you can actually follow them. You see them on AIS, you know, the, they kind of slide along the line, down the line. Um, and as history repeats, you know, they, all those squid boats, they end up in the canyon, the Hudson. Figure November, December, all those squid boats, they follow the squid and the squid go right to the Hudson. And once that happens, we get, an even cooler fishery, we get those big, big guys that mix in. Um, you catch them in shallow water, three, 400 feet. You know, we had a couple this year, um, you know, pushing 300 pounds. I mean, you know, we had a couple like 220, 230. A couple of my friends had them, you know, like I said, 300 pounds, like real, real big guys. You know, um, so it's mostly yellowfin. You get a couple bluefin mixed in here and there. Um, and then late in the season, you get those jumbo big eyes, which is, you know, send some baits down, get near the draggers where they're kind of working. And it's kind of like giant fishing, you know, just set up on a drift, put a couple big baits out and see what happens. But this year, especially, was really good for that big eye chump, you know, in the Hudson late season. When you're when you're putting those baits out, is it like a bait that they seem to be keyed in on? And you may not want to divulge all your information, but just no, like, no, listen. yeah, they eat. Yeah. You just fishing squids, or you fishing butterfish? You know, like how many flats are you bring in, like for a typical trip, that sort of thing? So yeah, so this typical trip, call it in like September, if we're just going to the canyon. I like ten flats. You know, I like having a lot of bait. Some of those dragger trips, we brought 15, you know, and we just kind of became our own dragger, you know, throw as much bait in the water. They, you know, we're a big boat like them, same size. So, you know, I would do a lot of moving of the boat in and out of gear, make a lot of noise. You know, they usually come to you. Um, but like in the end of the season, that big guy stuff, it's fresh bait, you know, those those draggers they're squid fishing they're catching butterfish as a bycatch a lot of the butters they shovel right back over so i like using butterfish you know it's kind of what's there it's what the big guys are used to eating and you know but you guys are catching them on squid on mackerels but i'm a big fresh butterfish guy you know chunks holies doesn't matter sure um, <clears throat> doesn't matter too much. Um, for baits, I like whole ones. Um, uh, you know, it's always depends on the current. You know, if you have a lot of current, you know, butterfish tend to spin sometimes. So I like a lot of, you know, working baits, send them out with the current. Once you get to the end of your top shop, reel it back in, you know, um, I want to say, oh, uh, like 90% of the big eyes we caught later in the season were right out of our hands. You know, no weight, um, just kind of, you know, eating the chunks as we're sending them out and, you know, it worked well, but again, not too much of a science to that. Um, it's more just, you know, right size leader, you guys know, making sure everything's perfect, crimps, the whole lot. Yeah. Yeah. Just attention to detail and all that stuff. So one fish. Which I know you best with. <laughs> <laughs> One one thing I definitely want to talk about is that yellowfin. Ugh. I so I've seen would... pictures. This thing is enormous. Can you can you walk us through like when you caught it, how it happened, what it ate, the fight, all that uh, kind of stuff. How the heartbreak like, saw it the first time. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I, I've kind of learned to accept it. It could have went a million different ways, you know, and that particular fish, we were on the fence of the tournament. You know, I have the line 
which is the fence. Again, don't quote me on this. I think it was like 153 miles from Montauk. It was the east wall of Hydro was our limit. We pull up, where's all the boats? Right over the east wall on the other side. We're like, God damn it. You know, we see all them trolling over there. So we're hugging the wall. We're doing passes. We start seeing yellowfin jumping out of the water, you know, feeding on the surface. Caught a bunch. Um, then we get a big bite. Fight it for, I think it was like 35 minutes. My boss was on the rod. And my boss is awesome on the rod, you know, which is a huge thing. You hook a tournament fish. I give it to Albert. And I don't even have to look at him. You know, he knows everything. He knows the deal. So we get a big bite. We wind up landing it. It was like a 150 big eye. Um, this was at like noon. So we're like, great. You know, we're catching yellowfin. We got a nice big guy in the boat. Um, so we're trolling around. A bunch of boats getting bit. Um, and I mark one at 75 feet. And I think everybody was downstairs. I was by myself. I look at the mark and I turn around. And as I turn around, it imploded on my bridge rod, which is right behind me in the rocket launcher upstairs. Um, I scream like, oh, there he is. And it was uh, a three ounce, I call it cream sickle, the color, uh, TN tackle head. It's like a custom color he made last year with a pink worm on it, a pink bronzy. Um, fish comes up, annihilates it. I'm like, oh, sick. I said instantly, like, it's an eyeball for sure. I watched him eat. Um, my boss gets on the rod, we clear the lines. Um, and he kind of gets into his groove 20 minutes in I'm like this thing's being weird now it's out off the side of the boat kind of on the surface and uh, you know walking right side with the boat and then I see the leader I'm like this is kind of quick to see leader and I'm thinking in my head of Mako you know how like sometimes a Mako just swims with the boat like yeah. not really fighting kind of dead weight like, is this a fucking Mako? Five minutes goes by, comes to this side of the boat, and then I see it. I'm like, oh, dude, it's, I'm like, it's a six foot tuna. It's a 70 inch big guy, you know? So now this is when kind of, not regret, but hindsight's 2020. We have the leader, the swivels like two feet off the rod tip. Um, my mate's like, should I grab the leader and, you know, pull him up? I'm like, we're 20 minutes in. It looks like a 200, 200 plus pound fish. We're at the leader. Let's not, you know, rush it. We're in good shape. So the leader starts creeping away, pulling a little drag, pulling a little drag. And half hour later, he's 200 yards out. I'm like, fuck, we should have grabbed the leader, but whatever. <laughs> uh, we get another, you know, look at the fish. And again, I don't see it. I just saw it was a tuna. And my mate, Jeff, while it's kind of, you know, behind the boat, he looks up with not a lot of confidence, but he's like, might be an Allison. I didn't even, it didn't even process at the time, you know, like, like whatever. So we're fighting it. We're fighting it. And now we're getting close to the fence trying to get the fish away. I'm trying not to lose line while walking the boat away from the tournament fence. And I think we were 0.1 miles away from the fence. Now I'm like freaking out all the boats. And I'm like, listen, everybody's keeping an eye on us. We can't make a mistake at all. Um, you know, bumping the boat in and out of gear. And I swear to God, every, any, you know, a lot of guys remember that day as I'm near the fence like what is that and it was a long line drifting towards us from the east on the other side of the fence coming towards us like oh my god there's a fucking long line i hear another boat hooks it in one of their diving plugs so they're freaking out like oh we got this long line and everybody's trying to avoid it and it's just coming right closer and closer to us um, so now i'm walking it away walking it away and now we're an hour and a half into the fight. 
you know, I have all my drag scaled. I think at the time we were at 35 pounds of drag. Um, so had some heat on the fish. Real drag, real drag on a stand-up rod for sure. Real drag on a stand-up rod. You know, my boss is a beast when it comes to that. Um, so I'm thinking, listen, things are going all right. So now fish is kind of on the surface, you know, coming in. Uh, and then I see it like a four foot dorsal fin i'm like no way i just saw what it and it wasn't it was the hammerheads you see eat those 200 pound tarpons in the flats with the huge curved fin I'm like dude is that a fucking giant hammer i'm like it better not be and it disappears so I didn't really think much of it. You know, it's been a long time since I've had a tuna shark up in the Northeast. So it wasn't even, I was more shocked to see that hammerhead than I was like thinking it was going to do anything to our fish. So the hammerhead disappears and not 10 seconds later, my boss gets pulled to the gunnel and the fish sounded like, I think it ran for two minutes total straight down, just peeled line off and i think a minute in i kind of started to be like oh no like that tuna just got a second wind something happened and then it slows down and i saw my boss with the rod boom like that and he starts reeling and he starts reeling and there's still a load on the rod but nothing's happening i'm like I'm like shit i'm like ow Either we got sharked or you're reeling up ahead or something. And sure enough, you know, 10 minutes of reeling, five minutes of reeling, starts planing up to the surface. I'm like, this is not a good look. And like 200 feet behind the boat, the head pops up. I'm like, fuck. I'm like, it's a fucking jumbo big eye. It got eaten. Tail's gone. And the fish kind of corks up turns on its side and a wave hits it and it's spun and i saw like a three foot sickle fin and i was like god no <laughs> and got it next to the boat i swear to god you can ask anybody we get it next to the boat my mates maddie and jeff stuck gaffs in it and looked up at me like they were gonna cry we pulled it through the door and I remember collapsing. I'm upstairs. I'm on the ground, hand, uh, face in my hand, just like, no way. And it wound up with the tail and like four chunks this big taken out of the back. It weighed 171. So we guess like 205 to 215 somewhere um, in a tournament disqualified i'm on the radio like guys we just got a 200 pound yellowfin and it got sharked right at the boat and guys are like yeah right. i'm sure it's like 120 pounds you know like 200 pound yellow i'm like no i'm like this thing has a sickle fin that's like 38 inches um and we got it unfortunately disqualified from the tournament so um, I think we lost out on like 50 grand or something. Um, oh, I, it was a somber couple of hours on the boat. I remember just sitting there like this is the, that was the fish I always dreamt of catching like a 200 pound Allison in, in the Northeast. Um, my dream fish, you know, ne nonetheless, with my boss in a tournament, like it's what you dream of. And, yeah that hammerhead robbed us, you know? Um, but on the flip side of things, he could have broke it off. And we just would have thought we lost a big guy. You know, we never in our wildest dreams, you know, believed it to be an over 200 pound yellowfin. And, you know, we didn't place. There were luckily a couple guys went out after, and they caught some. Uh, my buddy Galvin, I think you guys know John, he had a nice one, like 40-ish. Um, and a couple guys in the tournament we were in had, I think, a 170, maybe a 182. Um, so it's cool that they're around, you know. 
Um, unfortunately, that one didn't pan out for us, but in the grand scheme of things, I wouldn't change a thing. You know, yeah, we could have grabbed the leader and wipe, but we could have broke it off. You know, you never, at least we got to see it, is kind of what I'm getting at, you know? Um, and, and you have a Hemingway, my, you have a Hemingway story now, you know? You have, you have the story that we all cringe about, but dream about at the same time. Listen, I live it every day. I think about it all the time. And, you know, yeah, we could have leadered it. Yeah, we could have, but it's just, you never know, man. And, we got the fish in. I, I actually talked to you guys, you know, about uh, saving the sickle fin. Yeah. Um, I just didn't have any work all summer. Um, I wound up just painting the thing with epoxy. And I have one from Venice that we caught that was 190. And this one is like double the size. And that, that like hurts me to my core. That <laughs> the biggest yellow fin I, I hooked here, you know, which is nuts. But you know, it's cool that they're around. Um, and the other cool thing is a handful of them have been caught in the past decade. All of them that I know that were caught were caught, caught within the same one week time span over the past six years. So that's interesting. They're showing up the same week over the past couple of years. So I told my boss, I was like, listen, take off of work. We're going to spend the whole week <laughs> out there. We'll quadruple overnight it. Um, but it's cool seeing that fishery, you know, because guys like Mark and, you know, even my dad and my uncle, like they always painted the canyon and tuna fishing is some crazy place, which it is. But they got to see those giant elephants, you know, and. The fact that we're seeing a couple more each year, I mean, that's promising, man. Oh, you yeah. know, these act like they used to. You know, they were catching them at the tower, like inshore, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So if that comes back, man, that that would be awesome. And it looks like, you know, knock on wood, it, it's coming back a little. So, yeah, that's exciting. As long as we hold on to the bait and yeah, keep all the ingredients there, you know. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by the Dion Children Foundation. The Dion Children Foundation was established by the Dion family as a way to bring awareness to rare and ultra rare genetic diseases in children, such as limb girdle muscular dystrophy or LGMD. LGMD is a neuromuscular disease that causes progressive muscle weakness, leading to the loss of ambulation and eventually affects the heart and lungs. Recently, the Dion family was faced with the heartbreaking news that their son Peter and daughter Maggie were diagnosed with LGMD and are battling this rare disease. The core belief at the Dion Children Foundation is that no child should be left behind. For more information or to donate to this incredible cause and family, please visit the Dionfund.org. The Dion Foundation is also the official charity of the 2023 Nantucket Big Game Battle. So if you are fishing that event this summer, uh, good luck and thank you so much for the support. You were talking about fishing for four days for this jumbo elusive elephant. What's what's something that you we've been asking some of the podcast guys this What's something that. Uh, that you've always wanted to do you've always wanted to spend time doing either in the canyons or inshore or whatever tactic wise that you've never really uh -huh. spent time doing that you think it'd either be productive or just to see if it would work you know maybe something yeah. in another country or something like that so as far as our area um kite fishing you know i feel like that's the least done thing in the canyons you know i think it could be super productive situationally you know i think if you get out there you don't see a single thing on the surface nothing again might not be the best idea but you know for example like 2015 2016 you would only catch big eyes in the pilot whales you know now little you know it's not the same but that year, there was some like symbiotic relationship between big eyes and pilot whales. You know, pilot whales eat big eyes, but for some reason, this population of pilot whales and big eyes, 
you know, just focused on squid. And, you know, I think situations like that, where you have an area of life with pilot whales and tuna, you know, sending a kite up with a live mackerel in the middle of that, that was something I always wanted to do. Um, but outside of this area is kind of apply what we know to other places like, you know, the Azores, they have, you know, Lago Mera, Canary Island, stuff like that. They have insane big eye fishing, you know, and to them, big eye fishing is pulling four Marlin lures on, you know, 600 pounds, two miles off the beach. Oh yeah, we're getting 300 pound big eyes as bycatch. Like not my dream is, but one thing I always had in my mind to do is apply our big eye fishing tactics to other places, you know, go to La Gomera with, you know, a spread full of ballyhoo and deep diving plugs and, you know, 180 fluoro instead of, you know, cable and 700 and whatever they're using. Um, because I'll say it. I mean, I think the Northeast has the best big eye fishermen in the world, you know, just, because we got to go so far, you know, like half these guys, they go out for a quarter day trip. They catch big guys two miles off the beach. You know, you guys know what goes into a Canyon trip. You know, you're driving a hundred miles, bad weather. Um, just, yeah, I really do think the Northeast has the best big option in the world. And I think if you took, you know, these guys, these boats, these spreads, you know, apply them to places like the Azores and La Gomera, you know, Days that guys go out, get one or two big eye bites. I mean, you know, we could be pulling these spreads over there, getting covered up five, six on at a time. So that's something always in the back of my mind thinking, man, I'd really like to bring the five C's to the Azores and, exactly. you know, try this there. Just applying different, you know, strategies in different parts of the world that guys aren't familiar with. You know, but maybe you don't need to pull 10 rods. You know, it works with the guys pulling four marlin rods, you know, but you never know. So that's definitely something I've always been interested in, you know, just taking this unique big eye fishery we have and just applying it somewhere else, you know, because I really don't know places in the world where guys crush big eyes, you know, like some of the boats up in the Northeast. Yeah. You know, they have days where they couple but they're also not targeting them you know it's also that I mean, time, i'm sure you got like the time of day and stuff too like if they have access that close to shore are they out there for sunrise are they out there for sunset that's one thing i've learned in other parts of the world is they don't care about first light <laughs> you know like i mean i've been to panama a bunch like we get there 10 o'clock in the morning and it's going off and me being like a northeast guy I'm like yo what's it like an hour before sunlight here you know it's got to be so much better but you know it seems in other parts of the world they don't need to put in that extra effort yeah to be successful so surely if they did you know they might be twice as successful but you know that's one thing i've noticed you guys know with bluefin fishing i mean you want to be there in the dark set up you know waiting for things to happen and it's kind of not like that in a lot of places in the world. I mean, if you follow like, uh, I'm sure you guys follow uh, Anthony Shea, the Bad Company program. Yeah. You know, they got both Mars fishing every day, you know, but they leave at like nine in the morning. You know, to me, I'm like, I'd like to be back at nine in the morning. But, you know, it's to me, it's the what ifs. Like, what if you were there in the dark? What if you pulled 10 rods instead of four? What if you lightened up leaders, you know? Yeah. Um, Hawaii. That's another, the cool part. Hawaii, Kona is another place I'd like to do first light to last light, to full tuna spread, spreader bars, spreader yeah. values, dredges. You know, like, not that the guys don't, you know, have some version of that, but for the most part, it's four or five, four or five hard heads and you know, a teaser and a dredge or two and, you know, lure offshore lure fishing was essentially developed there. So I, I understand that that's part of their fishery and their heritage and, and everything like that. But I just think if you brought like, you know, what we have there and the timing of it, I just feel like you'd annihilate just like four ballyhoo instead of four jets. Yeah. You know, like how many more, 
how many more bites you gotta get. Yeah. And they have Ballyhoo. Think about they have schools of Ballyhoo in the harbor. I know. You yeah. throw the net on them. And, you know, 50 select that. Yeah. Um, to actually expand on that, like, it's, it sounds awesome. And, you know, we think it would be some epic thing. But on the flip side of things, I think it was like 12 years ago, I went to Panama. And I was going every year for like three or four years. And one time I'm like, listen, I'm going to bring splash bars. I'm going to bring Islanders and Joe shoots with Ron Z's. I'm going to show these guys how it's done. Dude, we went out Hannibal bank, the sickest foamer you've ever seen in your entire life. I'm like oh, game over two spread bars, two Ron Z's. And we were Doinking the spreader bars off the far heads of the elephant, and they wouldn't touch it. Didn't get a single bite. Two spreader bars, two Ronzies through the melee, and they never touched it. That's so amazing. talk about like, you know. Wow. <sighs> if you had to, um, another great question. What's our budget? Hundred. Yeah, hundred bucks. Hundred bucks. Five rods. Yep. Five rod canyon spread. Terminal gear. You don't have to buy ballyhoos. You don't have to buy just skirts, lures, bars, lure components, whatever. Hundred bucks to catch everything. To catch everything in the canyon. Next question: What am I looking to catch? Well, no, feed everything. Like you know, yeah. you're, you're looking to put together a decent trip. Like they will catch everything: tunas, billfish, stuff to feed the family, whatever. Hundred bucks, five rod spread. What would it be? Right off the bat, I mean, I'll get made fun of with this: a goggle eye CD thirty. I am convinced there's not a better, better big eye lure in the history of the world. What goggle eye? Thirty bucks. Yeah, call it 30 bucks with hooks and split rings. So you got seven. No, make it three. And uh, no, just uh, (laughs) goggle ICP 30. Um, this one you could interchange blue and white islander or three ounce Joe shoot blue and white. Um, split bill balance. For sure, split bill ballyhoo. Um, Get that for free because that's only terminal gear. So I'm glad you mentioned it, but split bill ballyhoo doesn't count. Got it. Perfect. Um, so three more split bills naked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, God. Um, I have to just because it caught the sickest fish of my entire life. A cream sickle TN tackle three ounce head um with a pink ron z oh with a ron z that's expensive yeah but that yeah, 30 dollars like, we'll, say, we'll say he like opened a bag on his buddy's boat and stole the tail right. so he doesn't have to so buy another 20 bag. bucks all right we'll call that 20 so you're at you're at 70 at discount you're at 70 bucks three rods <laughs> Well, we know that you like the split bill horse value. We're not going to include that. You have two more rods to fill. You have 30 bucks. Select value. So select value. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, I mean, you could literally interchange any of those, but a crystal pink Joe shoot with a, with a Ron Zier value or Melton Cherry Jet um, is one of the few single lures I pull with nothing on it. Uh, what think- color, what yeah. color ch- Cherry Jet you like? I like black and green. Um, it's just one of the things that have been on a lot of boats that guys liked it, pulled it, and it worked well. Um, but honestly, it's to me it's a value on a skirt. A Ronzi on a skirt and that CD30. You know, I know Nomad came out with a bunch of swimming plugs. Um, you know, they work as well, but that CD30, 
is like old faithful to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I troll two at all times. If I'm big eye fishing, I've even pulled three on occasion, you know, depending how much boat traffic and stuff like that. But I think that would be my hundred bucks. Wow. You know, it's not ordinary. Uh, I'd love to throw some spreader bars in there, but they're like a hundred bucks a pair. So <laughs> <laughs> if I had to pick, you know, I'd pick four or five, you know, skirted bars and plugs over two, uh, over two bars. But even so, man, the bars the past couple of years have just been producing like crazy. Especially the, with these new track. Stuff like that. My tracker stuff has changed the game. Yeah. The, uh, Listen, a lot of people make fun of them. You know, and a lot of people say it's, you know, oh, it brings it into the clear water, stuff like that. I think it helps being out in the clean water, you know, track it away from the boat. But if you look at those things from underwater, it's the way they move. You know, it's to me, the bread and butter isn't that it's in clear water. You know, the fish are attracted to commotion, they're attracted, you know, to the wash, stuff like that. It's, it's the way they move. They kind of like, Wow. track out and he yeah they're so like aggressive and they're so jerky and you know i mean you get a couple bites on a boat of tuna they start blowing up on the spread what's the first thing you're supposed to do you know jig rods and do that like these things are basically being jigged the whole time the way they track out and dart back and forth and i think it triggers a lot of bites with these fish you know i think that's what it is that's what the magic of those bars are is the way it's some unpredictable movement, you know, and if it's tuna, I mean, a lot of times we don't see it, but you know, you see it a lot with these dredge cams and that guys are coming out with now is tuna follow the boat. You know, you see it with even the spotter planes, like guys will be driving around. There'll be tuna, you know, under the riggers kind of just hanging with the boat. So I think those unnatural movements trigger these things to bite sometimes you know i mean you could have tuna in your spread for 15 minutes looking you know they might not eat anything they might just be swimming i mean like you see it in these dredge cams a lot but those random movements and stuff like that i, I think that's what makes them so successful you know regardless of what brand i agree on the on the cd30s I'm assuming you're fishing them, you know, in flat line position or whatever. Maybe I'm wrong, but are you fishing them off the tip? Are you fishing them in a tight clip right off the tip? Yeah. So I'll usually, uh, you know, one short and one close. And people ask me how short. I mean, we've had them 20 feet off the tip. Like where you think it's going to fly out of the water back at you. Like it's not that deep. It's right under... In, in a perfect world, I would like my close CD30 to be just below my wash. So figure like six feet down, you know, something like that. Um, and I can tell you 90% of the times you get covered up with big eyes, the plugs go down first. I mean, it's almost a guarantee. You know, one plug, two plugs, you turn around and then, you know, bars start going off and you know, skirted lures start getting bit, but you know, funny story. I uh, we were making videos for uh, the waterproof page. Mark and I this was like nine years ago in Florida. We're driving around. We made like a fresh ballyhoo chain, and we're like, listen, you know, we'll put it out with a camera and see how it swims. So we're doing all these things, like trying to get underwater footage of the lures, and I'm like, listen. Let me jump in the water. You put out a couple plugs, troll by me, and I'll video the plugs. You know, we'll see like what it looks like from a fish's point of view. So I jump in the water with a poly ball. I'm like floating around South Florida somewhere like an idiot. Um, <laughs> he does a water. He puts the plugs in the water, and he's got to be two football fields away. The second he put the plugs in the water. I put my head under, all I heard were those plugs from football fields away. They are so loud under the water. It is like this crazy rattling. It's really, really loud. Um, 
So he starts coming towards me, coming towards me. I go under and it sounds like they're an inch from my ear. I go up, I'm waving my arms like, stop. I didn't know where they were, where they're coming from. But I think that's a big piece of the puzzle, man. They make so much noise. These fish have to keep right in on them, you know? So I think it's a sound thing, you know? And I think when these fish come up, you know, Essentially, when you're trolling, your whole boat's teaser, you know, so they hear all this noise, all this ruckus, they come up and on their way up. There's something right in their face, you know, it tends to be the first thing they bite. Um, Have you but yeah, I'm a CD forever. What was that? You tried them for giant bluefin? <sighs> for some reason, it doesn't work as well. Don't know what it is. We've caught them. We've caught them in North Carolina. But also, one thing to keep in mind is these bombers are like, I don't want to say once and done. Yeah. But I have a giant box full of bombers with wires ripped out, snapped in half, you know, the lip broken off. Um, I'm sure we'd catch giants, but I don't want to be attached to a 500-pound tuna with that. <laughs> Plastic plug being the only thing keeping us, you know, together. Um, but we just not as much success with bluefin than you would think. I think they just, you know, which is like a quieter, quieter spread in space. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> like generally, like especially yeah. bigger fish, like, you know, 90, 100 inch plus fish. You know, they'll get competitive feed in the spread, but like, you know, up by us in shallow water, a lot of times it's one fish coming up in the spread and looking at everything before he makes a decision. And they just want that nice, quiet trickle, that slower yeah. approach. You know, you mentioned Ron's e-tails a ton uh, or just tails in general a ton. Are you seeing a, a big difference of bites? Like, some days or they seem like they're more keyed in on the tails versus the ballyhoo. Does it seem fairly 50 50? Um, I don't want to say 50 50. It's also situational. Um, you know, a lot of times if we're fishing like a change or something out east and you get this a lot with weeds, grass in the water, you don't want to be pulling a split bill. You know, that's going to be digging down, catching all the grass. You're going to be snapping bills. And I like the Ronzi's for ease of use. You know, you can literally rip one in in the rigger super fast. All the weeds come out, let it back out, you know, stay in the water longer. Um, with the Ronzi, you know, it's swimming perfect. You know, Bob off the corner can rig it just as good as, you know, some guy that's been rigging Bally for 20 years. You know, um, it's guaranteed to be swimming perfect all the time. That being said, if you were to ask me in a perfect world, I'll take a split bill value over any lure always, you know, but also ease of use. Like, you know, if you're catching every time you put the boat in gear, you have five yellowfin come up. I'm not going to be sitting there, you know, making swell. I'm going to hook the thing through the eyes and throw it in the water. You know, it's um ronzies are quick at that too you know um, but in a perfect world i would pick a properly rigged value with wire no chin weight over a ronzi any day you know but um it's usually a 50 50 split in my spread you know, i'll pick up on any trends if you know they're chewing the rubber that day switch over you know, it's pretty similar to what everybody else does. You know, find out what works on that day and kind of, you know, adjust your spread accordingly. What's your go-to hook for split bill ballyhoos? 76, 91. Um, you know, I know uh, Quick Rig makes those Kogas. They're great hooks, too. They're awesome. Um, you know, I just like the 76, 91. The size of the eye makes it a little easier putting it inside the ballyhoo, tucking it away, you know, wiring it up. Um, not super picky with hooks, you know, definitely 76, 91s. Um, stainless for canyon fishing, you know, for like North Carolina, giant fishing, stuff like that, the Duratin ones. Yeah. Um, you know, but Quick Rig makes a good hook. 
um, definitely not Jobu. That's the only thing I could say. I'm anti Jobu camp over here. Um, I just never. <laughs> <laughs> How I see guys using them, like, hey, it might work for you, great, but I just never had success with them. And uh, I'm a Mustad guy. Yeah. Cool. Um, touch it. I know. I think it was Taylor I was talking to. Like, I love talking geek stuff, fishing. Yeah, or that. I remember about the Crips. Yeah. Uh, and I think you were the SG guy. Yeah, we're fishing. We fish LIs and SGs. Yeah. That's the way. That is the way. Um, you know, I do. Uh, like the double barrel copper crimps and you know um it's good for spreader bars and stuff like that that you know it's not aluminum crimp it lasts a lot longer but when it comes to strength and giant fishing it's sg and li the blue jay high crimpers i mean to me that's the way to go and i think i was against you when you said that back in the right, day. not right. that i was against you but i was like listen I did some testing. Um, there's a place by us, Trophy Tackle, and the guy John is like a connection, like professor, and he has one of those breaking strength machines. And we did quite a few tests. SG, you know, with Seaguar regular, um, we couldn't beat it. That was the way to do it. Yeah. SG and LIs with the blue jank eye crimpers. Yeah, we tested trailer hitch tested here. We've done the line machine and yeah. up in PEI and those jink eye crimps, you know, match to blue label or you know, jink eye monofilament. It just seems to be the strongest. I know some guys are using Mamoy crimps with the blue jink eye crimpers as well and doing fine. Um, but you know, you're never really gonna put you know, 150 pounds of pressure realistically on, on a crimp, but you never know when the thing's tail wrapped and all wrapped up and shit and you're hung up in a pot, lobster pot or whatever. It's like, I'd rather know that it's not going to move. Yeah. Say that again. Sorry, you came in quiet. Say your last sentence one more time. No, just you guys dealing with lobster pots. You know, I mean, that's like one out of 5,000 fish with me. You guys are dealing with it on like a week. Weekly basis, just oh, yeah, nightmare. Anchors, pots, anchors. No, just taking a deep it's breath is really the only way to get through it. <laughs> Take a deep breath, try to <laughs> try listen, not to freak out. out a little bit. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Tell us about uh the giant bluefin fishing down there. You know where you're kind of focusing on. I saw some pretty ridiculous videos. In yeah, so basically, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but there used to be a mud hole by here, which, you know, I was born in 84, I guess it was going on. I always said I was born in the wrong decade. Uh, um, maybe that's not the case. Um, basically, you know, what happened was um, Bunker came back. Um, you know, they put all these restrictions on all these bunker boats, like the Omega boats coming here and just stealing all our bunker pogies, whatever you guys call them. Um, and they stopped it. And like, I, I don't know exactly when, call it 15 years ago, but I grew up there my whole life, fishing there my whole life. And then like 15 years ago, we're going out in the ocean, we're like, look at all this bunker. I mean, five mile schools of it, giant schools of bunker. Um, we kept saying, like, imagine the tuna found this. Like, imagine the tuna that used to come to the mud hole by us, which was like 15 miles out. What if one comes by, sees this, tells his friends, you know, we were kind of like joking around with it. And, you know, like six years ago, we would see some tuna junk, like not fishable, but you'd be black fishing or something and, you know, striper fishing and, You'd see them come up. What the hell? You know, we always had that fishery like in November. We call them Jersey ghosts or ghosts. 
where tuna migrating from you guys are going south, they pass by us. They're like impossible to catch. You cast a thousand times and never catch them. Um, I guess some of these bigger fish found these bunker. So they started blowing up on bunker and, you know, one guy caught one five years ago and I think we caught one four years ago. And each year, the same week, they started showing back up and guys were seeing them. And then two years ago, it went off. Um, go just driving one day. We saw them feeding for like 20 minutes straight. Um, went back out and guys started catching them, you know, on poppers, on paddle tails. Um, this went on for a couple weeks, you know, guys started getting in the know and most of the fish were under 72 inches. You know, you'd get a couple here and there that were over, um, but most of the fish were unders and then they kind of disappeared for a couple weeks. Um, this was in July something happened they came back guys started fishing live bunker for them and it was nuts i mean i'm sure you guys saw videos of it no exaggeration 400 boats in three square miles four square miles what um it's like fish tails eight years ago the thing like, I remember one of the first trips I brought my boss, put a 10-pound bluefish out. He's like, there's no way. Anything. We put it out five minutes, the rod's going off. He's on the bow. We were using 50s at the time. He's on the bow fighting it. And here comes, like, Bobby Weekend in his, like, 14-foot game fisher with, like, four fluke rods, like, spearing squid dangling in the wind literally cut us off so bad that the line went around his center console like not cut us off remote, like he was about to get strangled that's how close he was <laughs> this was like you know like guys were there porky fishing in the middle of fleets of guys giant fishing and it was incredible you know, I mean, there were so many fish caught. You would go out, there were 300 boats, and 200 guys would get bit. Um, I think that year was probably the best bluefin bite on the East Coast. You know, um, it was crazy. Guys going out every day. If you Guys going out. I have a story. One of my friends went out with a buddy of his. It's not really a tuna fisherman. He's like, oh, you know, go get 130 fluoro from the store bring it out they get out there they set the boat on the drift they take the stuff out to start rigging he's like oh listen you know i went to the store there was 130 for 17 bucks and there was 130 for 100 he's like i got the spool for 17 bucks my friend pulls it out it's mono he's like they caught three fish that day on 130 mono um they just didn't care the yeah. fish were so ready to eat, ready to eat anything. And um, I think it lasted a hundred days, the bite. Um, Dude, that's, it was weird because that's, that was quiet up here. We didn't really hear it. We heard it. We knew it was good, up. but we didn't know it was that. We didn't know it was that good. It was that, like I was telling people, you know, my friends were doing charters like 20, 30 miles off. I'm like, listen, like you should probably take your charter here. Like, ah, you know, giant fishing. It's not for, I'm like, listen, like I was marking a hundred fish a day at some points. Um, I mean, in 40 feet of water, like, I don't even know how that's possible. They were coming through like 30, 40 thick and it was incredible. You know, uh, most of the fish, 80% of the fish were unders, you know, so it's, Good for a lot of guys that weren't commercial or, you know, whatever the story was, just for the fish in general. I mean, talk to any tackle shop that year was the biggest year for tackle for everything around here. Like, you know, guys sent their kids to college off this bite, you know, to local tackle stores and stuff. But uh, it was nuts. And then last year, I unfortunately didn't get to do it as much 
just because the canyon fishing was like you know, so red hot. And I was out East with the big boat doing the tournaments and stuff, but it seems like we have a legit bluefin fishery here now, you know, um, last year, I mean, I know guys were catching fish, you know, over a hundred inches, you know, um, we had some nice ones. A friend of mine had them, I think a hundred three inches on a popper. Um, <laughs> you know, it's all set with that. Yeah, that's, that's pretty gross. gross. <laughs> that's gross, but awesome. it's, it's absolutely disgusting. It was always on my bucket list. We caught a 500 pounder on a paddle tail. Never again. I want nothing to do with it. Don't call me if somebody's fighting one on a spinning rod. It was, it's all great. It's cool. You're when that fish is straight up and down, it's the most nightmare situation. You can't take a break. You can't touch the rod to anything, you know, like it's not like a conventional, you could rail rod and stick it in the, you're just stuck, you know, like they'd pass me the rod. I'd sit there for 30 seconds. I wouldn't even be able to take my hand off. And I'm like, okay, take it away from me now. Like, it's, <laughs> guys that do that, I have a, a newfound respect for, it. you know, I'm not talking like 200 pounders, like the guys that catch true giants, like, and do it often. That's super impressive on a spinning rod. Yeah, you know, I did it. I want zero to do with it for the rest of my life. I'll take a one thirty. Call me whatever you want in the gunnel. I don't care. Yeah. No more spinning rod. <laughs> I won't even do fifty stand up, eighty no. stand up anymore. It's like chair, or chair for up north or gunnel here. Yeah, you know. Guys, so you guys did the up north thing. I went to PEI. Oh man, in two don't quote me, maybe 2009. What an experience that was. Who do you uh who it, did you with? You remember? With Tony. Nice. Tony Buck. Um I remember we uh we got up there and it was actually the first time I met uh, my buddy, Sammy. I don't know if you guys know Sammy Gondor. He's into like chicken pop guy, salty water tackle. Oh yeah. Yeah. You probably see worlds for all these crazy fish, but he was up there and you know, we met him in the hotel and he showed me all these spinning rods. I'm like, this guy's a maniac up here with spinning rods. And um, he was telling me he's a guy, you know, they don't eat poppers up here. All right. We went out the next day and I remember uh, pulling out of North Lake and I heard the guy, Tony was on the radio and the guy's like, yeah, he's like, you better get out here. It's a real shit show. And I'm, I remember sitting in the back of the room like, what does that even mean? We, this was like really my first experience, like really giant fishing. I mean, I have in the past before that, but this is, I mean, you guys know PEI is like on another level. Um we're driving out. We make it a mile. And I remember I was the only one outside. And I'm looking at this herring boat. And the guy's like shoveling herring into a box. And he looks at me and sees me looking. And I'll never forget it. He took a shovel and sprayed it on the water. I feel like that was a moment that my life changed. Two seconds, you see the sickles and the boils. And I'm like, is this real? And we pulled. <laughs> And it was, I mean, you guys know, we sat there for three and a half hours before we even put a hook in the water. I mean, throwing the herring and we had hookless poppers and I'm just flipping pots, like 800 pounders just exploding on it. My dad, who's been a fisherman his whole life, was just sitting in the corner with a cup of coffee, smoking his Marlboro. We had a little pen spin fisher like boat rod with like 20 pound test. He would just take us a uh, herring, tie two overhand knots, flip it in the water. The fish would grab it, pull it off the line. He'd reel it back in, tie another one on. <laughs> he did it for hours just, but that place is something special, man. Oh, it's on what a sick. The experience that was. Um, we we had, caught a. We had one day up there. Taking a mackerel jig with the little treble hooks, 
you know, just having one hook on the treble, snipping the others off and pinning a mackerel on the back and flying it 15 feet out in the kite and just filming kite bite after kite bite after kite bite for like three hours, just, just sitting there filming kite bites. Sick. I could sit there and watch those things all day. We caught one of peanut butter and jelly, peanut butter and jelly sandwich scrunched up into a ball. <laughs> Somewhere we hook it in. We wound up fighting it for like two hours, but um, yeah, that place is you know, it's not, I guess it's dummy fishing at times, but to me, I don't even need a hook. You know, put me in the middle of that, give me a toe to herring, and I can sit there all day watching these things. It's seeing that amount that up close and seeing like how healthy the fishery is up there. Is, it's awesome. You know, I mean, I only been there once the second time we got blown out, but yeah, what, what an experience, what a fishery, watching, you know, the, the way they take watching the guys maneuver their boats through the gear and like, even just coming in and out of North Lake, it's like, you know, we think you have a pretty good handle on boat handling and maneuvering. And then you see those guys that have been doing it since they were 10 years old in those 45 foot down East boats. It's like, Oh my gosh. I think it was like a 49 foot hustler or something we were on and, you know, them ripping out of this, you know, North Lake, I think it was, we were coming out of that little shoot to get out of the Harbor. And there's like giant breakers. I'm like, these guys are out of their minds. Yeah. And it's like just another, you know, like no care. And I remember them telling us about the, uh, the flounder in the bay. He's like, yeah, you just use mackerel chunks. I'm like, mackerel chunks or flounder? I'm like, what planet are we on? Um, but yeah, that place was, that was an experience too, for sure. I recommend that to everyone. If not just for the fishing, just, just to see, you know, those fish, like just eating and the way they eat and how much they eat is sick. Yeah. If you get, you know, if stuff you go there, you get a good weather window that's where you learn how to fight big tunas. Like you just get so many shots. You understand what gear can do. You understand line angles, proper hook set. Like it's so visual and close and just build so much confidence so fast. Yeah. I, I, I always say that it's, 10 years of experience in one day. <laughs> you know, I mean, how time, how long does it take to hook 20 giant blue or whatever the number is? You know, I mean, it's you're cramming like uh you know tuna fishing one on one into one day. It's mm. you know, it's how you learn. Totally. It's definitely uh it's definitely a different planet up there, man. Oh, yeah. I'd like to I want to do the spreader bar thing with no hooks. Mm. Just Throw a camera up, troll around. There's some videos up there, guys doing it. It was awesome. We trolled a dredge. We trolled a, uh, epic a dredge by one of the herring boats. It's on, on one of our Instagram videos, but just watching them peel off. And like, you know, it's like one fish, eight, 800 pounders all behind the dredge. It's pretty wild, like effortlessly kicking their tail. Yeah, they don't swim as much as people think. Yeah. You know, they kind of just they like cruise and they barely kick. Mm -hmm. here and there yeah i feel like it's so much energy that they expel just to move, move that you know a couple paddles of the tail and they glide you know um, but yeah that's the place to see it man like you said it's just so much experience crammed into one day that would take you you know by me it would take you years to see that much stuff you know yeah, and yeah. it's a cool the way they do like the uh, muscles on the back of the boat with the beer and the butter. Um, that was actually the beginning and the end of my muscle obsession. <laughs> I was so <laughs> jazzed up. I'm like, let's, I got to get home. I'm going to buy the same beer they use. I'm putting it in a pot. I'm doing the garlic butter. I got the PEI muscles. This is one of the stupidest things I ever did, but I come home, I cook them. I'm like, this is going to be awesome. So I eat one after I cook it. I'm like, oh my God, this is bringing back to the back of the boat. Like it's absolutely delicious. Stupid me is like, you know what? Instead of me sitting here having 
deal with each muscle, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what if I just took all the meat out of each muscle and put it in a bowl? <laughs> Dude, I emptied all the muscles into a bowl and started eating it with a spoon. To this day, I can't eat muscles anymore. It like scarred me. I remember I took like three mouthfuls and I was like, what have I done? <laughs> and it made me not. And that was like the end of my muscle eating career. I'll have one or two now, but that traumatized me. muscle cereal. I feel like that's like lobster. Like if you break apart a whole oh. lobster, oh yeah, put all the fucking meat in the butter bowl and just start eating lobster with oh. a fork. It's like a little intense. Oh god, man. Uh, so now I stick to like cracking crabs individually, eating the piece individually. No more Lucky Charms bowls of muscles for me. Oh. Uh. Dude, that's the name of the yeah. podcast. Lucky Charms of Muscles. <laughs> yeah. Muscles for breakfast. Muscles yeah. for breakfast. <laughs> I never eat muscles again after this. <laughs> uh, yeah, cool experience. Speaking of sure. uh, speaking of treacherous inlets and boat handling and just kind of staying on the maybe fear of spiders theme too. What's the What's a moment offshore that you've had where you've truly been scared, scariest moment out there, you know, kind of a lesson learned story for, for anybody? Um, I've had a few at Oregon and let, you know, boats getting spun around um, in the inlet, which is terrifying. I say it all the time. I think the best captains in the world are the guys that go out of that inlet every day with a chart. Um, you know, Oregon Inlet for sure, crossing the bar in the dark, seeing nothing. You know, you have all your lights on, you see nothing. And then out of nowhere, just blinded white breaker. You know, you really can't do anything. But to me, Oregon Inlet is like a different world. Um, outside of there, um, I would say we had a trip on five C's, I think it was like 2017. It was a really good big eye bite in the middle grounds. Um, ton of boats out there, smaller big eyes. They were like 100 to 120 pounds. Um, we had a trip, we had 13 or 12. We were coming back with 12. Everybody's like on cloud nine. And one of the things I really enjoy about my job is after a trip, when everybody's stoked, you're driving home, you know, the boss is having some beers with his friends. We're all like, just, this is perfect. It's a really good vibe. And, you know, again, my boss is the man. So a lot of times I'm up for like 40 hours, you know, just how I am on these trips. Like, you know, it's eight years in, I think I'd be a little, I'm always just trying to catch as much as I can. Um, so I was kind of shot and my boss comes up, he'd showered. It's a beautiful ride home. He's like, oh, listen, you know, let me take over. You go take a nap. I'm like, oh, perfect. So I remember going, getting up, and my bilge light goes on for like a second. And at the time, I'm like, maybe fish box, maybe from cleaning the deck, dressing the fish. Maybe there's a little water. I go downstairs. I go to open the lazarette in the back, and the fish bag's there. So I'm like, eh. I walk back upstairs. I look. Bilge light comes on again. I'm like, fuck. I wake up my buddy. I guess you got to help me move this fish bag. As we move the fish bag, I go to lift the lazarette open and alarms start going off on the, uh, the cat display. I'm like, oh, no. So before I even get in the lazarette, I go to open the engine room. The second I open it, all I saw was red. Red, like I couldn't see it was like red fog I'm like what the fuck now all these a lot I feel the boat start bogging down I yell at my boss I'm like listen shut it down shut it down shut it down um we had popped a hole in a high pressure fuel line and the entire engine room from top to bottom was diesel mist and you know Diesel isn't really flammable, but if you atomize it, it's fucking flammable. At the time, I didn't really think of this. 
I run downstairs and get to the bottom of the engine room up to my shins in diesel. I'm like, holy crap. Really didn't know what to do. Both engines were in idle now. I can't see anything. There's spray everywhere. For some reason, I was like, let me see if I could get eyes on it before I shut the engine down. So I run. I kind of see where it's coming from. I shut the engine down. I'm head to toe diesel. Um, Now I could kind of see the entire ceiling was diesel. Do you know like the fluorescent lights that are in engine rooms? It's, you know, two little bulbs. and There's the plastic case around it, like the cover. Mm -hmm. Three out of the six of them, all six of them were filled with diesel. So to think that that diesel was shooting so hard into the ceiling that it got around those covers and literally every cover was filled with diesel to the top. And I remember just, I don't have a choice here. I had three gallons at dawn. You know, I have to get this stuff off the boat. I mean, listen, terrible but I had no choice. You know, I filled the whole bilge with soap, pumped everything out, um, and just, you know, got one engine going, limping home. The whole time I was in the engine room, you know, dealing with Dawn and Pumpy, putting into buckets, whatever I could. And, you know, come to realize how lucky we were. Because when diesel atomizes like that, you know, think about it with the turbos, the lights, like just the fluorescent lights, like some little spark, anything, the alternator covered in diesel, you know? So lucky. Oh, so lucky. That's nice. You know, and I remember like apologizing. I'm like, Al, I'm so sorry. He's like, what are you going to do? I'm like, oh, that, you know, that makes things a lot better when your boss is like, hey, it happens. I'm over here covered mortified you know 80 miles off and now we're doing eight knots home um but just being able to have your head on straight you know like i say people see facebook like oh it's so awesome that's the stuff they don't see you know like you're in an engine room the boat's rocking you're covered in diesel i can't see i can't breathe and just having you know being a mate you always have somebody to look like, oh, you know, the captain, like, but when you're the captain, like, that's it. You're the guy, you know, and having to be prepared for situations like that, you know, it could have been so much worse, but just being ready for stuff like that, you know, having a plan, knowing where, you know, your fire extinguishers are and having an emergency plan. I mean, you guys know is hopefully never need to use it or, you know, have to go through something like that, but just, you got to be prepared. You know, I like it's so, that was it's so important to reiterate. I mean, when you're, you know, even if you're 10 miles offshore, like not just a fisherman, you're a firefighter, you know, you're, you're a medic, you're, you're a medic, you're, you're everything, you know, it's yeah. into, you know, to, go through training or to talk about things or to purchase safety equipment, you know, those are all great things, but you have to become competent in it all, you know, you, and everyone on board yeah. should be too, like understanding, like touching and feeling and opening hatches of where things are just to develop that muscle memory. So when shit hits the fan, you know, you at least have a one step ahead, you're able to maintain situational awareness and that, kind of level headedness during a shit show like that. And, uh, you know, it seems like you're very detail oriented and it all worked out for you, but anyone listening, it's, you're not just going out there and bending a rod and selling fish and eating fish and whatever it's shit can go to, it can go south immediately. Yeah. And I feel like that's, that's where you earn your paycheck. You know, anybody could go out and pull spreader bars and stuff like that. And be like, oh, I'm the king of the ocean. We caught these big eyes. You know, it's fishing's the easy part. It's the getting the fishing to go smoothly, getting home, getting back and forth. You know, it's every little event prepares you for the one time that you need to be prepared. And you know, the second, actually funny story, the second trip on five seas ever that we had, we were in like a thousand fathoms of the Hudson. And one thing I tell people is 
don't be embarrassed. If you think you smell something, if you think you hear something, if something's lighting up that wasn't light, don't feel weird. You know, tell me everything. And remember one time I was laying down inside the salon and my friend uh, who was mating for me at the time, I don't have a full-time mate on the boat. I have awesome friends that, you know, I have regular friends that come, my friend Jeff, my friend Matt. Um, but at the time I had a friend on the boat, I'm laying down and I remember like, I feel like I was dreaming that I was hearing something and I hear the salon door open. He taps me. He's like, yo, Steve, he's like, some noise is coming from the engine. Room. What? I open the engine room. And as soon as I open it, it sounds like water rushing in the boat. All these alarms go off. I go to run down. I take a breath of air. It almost was like somebody had plastic over my mouth. Like I went to go breathe and nothing happened. It was a very weird feeling. I never experienced anything like it. Like imagine breathing, but your mouth sealed. Like nothing goes in your in your chest. And then alarms start going, like school fire alarm, metal bells going off. I'm like, are we getting like hit by a torpedo? Like what the hell's going on? And fucking <laughs> fire safety. The whole fire suppression in the engine room went off, shut down the engines, kill switch the generator. Now I'm in a thousand fathoms, trip two at three in the morning, pitch black. Like, holy shit, I go upstairs. I uh, bypass the emergency cutoff, open all. We realize that it sprayed the, uh, I think it's radon. Yeah. Uh, and I couldn't breathe. If I went down there, like I could have died in there. Neither could like, the engine. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. engine can breathe either. But you know, we figured out, you know, bypassing it, getting everything vented out, engine room fans started, everything was fine. But I remember like we got it all figured out. I got the engine started, and I sat in the captain's chair, like I was sweating all the this is the craziest night of my life in the canyon ever. And I remember like two hours later, my boss comes up and my boss always makes fresh coffee in the morning. And he comes up, hands me a cup of coffee. He's like, oh man, what a beautiful night. You guys have a good night. And I'm like looking at him like covered in shit. I'm like, you guys didn't hear that? Everybody on the boat slept through the fire alarms through like, the school's out, metal bell ringing. And I was like, you know, fire alarm went off last night. We lost all power. We were in the dark for an hour. He's like, oh, man, that's crazy. <laughs> it goes to show you, like, thankfully, that was a fire drill, so to speak. But, you know, now we kind of know what to expect. You know, if it ever does happen, bypassing it, how the engine shut down, the generator, you know, like I said, all that stuff prepares you for the hopefully not. But if you ever have to, you know, it's a culmination of all those little things. And, you know, hopefully I never have to deal with it. Hopefully you guys never have to deal with it. Anybody I know has to deal with it. But that's when you earn your paycheck, you know, when things go wrong. When things go right is the easiest. Thing. You know, it's having those hiccups and getting the rope in the wheel and, just being ready for all that stuff, you know, it's, it, it's what the captain's there for, you know, the fishing's the easy part, the, you know, talking to people is the easy part. It's when things go wrong is when you earn your check. hundred percent. Dude, that was awesome. Yeah. That's some, I'm really, <laughs> I it's, a tough. <laughs> it's just, you don't think of these things, you know, like, and what I thought was water rushing in was, radon halon halon whatever it is that was the tank emptying it and it was just, it sounded like rushing water you know and um i saw what i thought was smoke i thought it was steam from the water rushing in hitting the engines but it was actually that halon or whatever it is that was you know getting sprayed out and sucking the oxygen out of the air Great. quite the experience yeah <laughs> it sounds terrifying <laughs> oh what else, something. what else you got for Steve? Dude, I think that was freaking great. That was probably people are gonna love it. We've that. been going for almost two hours, bro. This has been awesome. 
We'll do. Is it really? Oh yeah, it's eleven thirty, eleven twenty one. Addy, nice. It's awesome. Nice. I feel bad. Like background, I feel like a terrorist doing some sort of <laughs> televised. Guys, I can have you. I can have you hold up yeah. like your your name and everything on a sheet of paper. <laughs> Steve, blink twice if you're in trouble. <laughs> I got my tape to the wall over there, so she doesn't make any noise. Oh, that's awesome! But no, man, this has been awesome. Like you're an incredible storyteller, and we enjoy. I appreciate following, it. enjoy following you guys and your program on social media. Definitely keep it up. And I mean, you have a you're very professional. Um, you know, we're all around the same age, but just watching your program, you know, we definitely admire what you got going on. And um, likewise, I, I hope the uh, Hello. Do. is uh, you guys do the same thing. And you know what it is? Like, you probably see it on Instagram, all these stupid memes. Like, if you're passionate about something, like you guys are, like you guys live for this, like I do, like, Talent doesn't stand a chance. You know, like if you're dead passionate about something, somebody could be talented and not passionate and they'll just, they don't, don't hold a stick to it, you know? And I feel lucky that I found something that I am dead passionate about. I was able to turn into a job just like you guys did, you know? And everything else comes easy. You know, if you do something you love and something you're passionate about, like it, it everything comes secondhand. And, you know, same thing with your videos and the way you guys post stuff, like it's professional and you guys do the right thing. And it's, you know, comes natural to you guys because like me, you guys are obsessed with it. You know, when you do something like it's corny, but when you do something you love, you never work a day in your life, you know, and even you though it's to, a lot of hard work. You have to make it your identity. Like, you know, we are charter captains, charter fishermen, you, you know, like if you make it your identity and your passion, like you said, like financially and the ability to support yourself, whether it will follow, you know? Yeah. And one thing, you know, like where I live, you know, I live in Long Island. Um, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of private boat jobs here and stuff, but just to like younger kids, like just bust your ass. Like if you're looking to do something like this, the opportunities are there and, you know, put yourself out there, work as hard as you can, like go on boats, work harder than everybody else on the boat so that they invite you back. And, you know, one thing people used to say to me back then is like, oh, you're a boat whore, you're a boat whore. It's not that like, if you're young and you're doing that, if people are inviting you back on their boats, it's because you're doing the right thing. And if you work hard, and all these guys want you coming out on their boats. Don't let people tell you with a boat whore. And this is no people are inviting you back because you work hard and you know, you work hard and you enjoy what you do. Like sky's the limit. And you know, you can get jobs like mine, get jobs even better. Friends that travel the world doing this, you know, it's work hard and, you know, do something you love and everything else really comes easy, you know? I mean, like, look at you guys. You start just a little trying. You got podcast. You know, you're selling stuff. You got all, you know, the tales, and it's all because you guys love it. You know, you're not doing it because you hate it. And you know, there's a lot of opportunity for kids out there and younger guys. So work hard. You know, and every people realize it, and everything else comes easy. You know, not easy, but yeah, you know, you could definitely make a living. Totally. How do um? How does everyone follow what you got going on? on instagram whatever yeah so um on instagram you can follow me my uh it's been my email address since i was like two years old it's the word car e-a-r-d r-o-k um quick story when i was younger i was on a t-ball team and it was the cardinals the shamrocks and the aces there weren't a lot of people so they had to combine the cardinals and the shamrocks and that's how I got my stupid name. When I was making AOL in like 1993, I was like, oh, Card Rocks are cool. <laughs> and like, never changed my email. So um, that's that, man. Um, it's easy to find. Yeah, easy to huh? 
It's easy to find and easy to remember. That's for sure. People ask me all the time, what is that? Oh, God, no. Just an easy word that I've had for 30 years. Um, but yeah, follow me on Instagram, Facebook. Um, I guess I'm too old for TikTok, although I should get a TikTok or something. <laughs> my, my wife tells me another thing I uh, got to keep track of. But um, yeah, that's it, man. Cool, dude. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Steve. We're 100 million percent going to do another one of these with you. So, yeah, um, I always like talking to stuff, you know, talking to trade with guys that love it too. So, you know, anytime, reach out, man. I'd love to do it again. Maybe I come up to you guys or something, um, awesome. figure something out. And maybe something like fishing behind me. So, it doesn't look like I'm like, uh, kidnapped over here <laughs> yeah. or or we come down to you or meet somewhere you know it's not no sweat on our end either so we appreciate it very much yeah uh, likewise with you guys yeah for sure so we're going to end this on our father's three words of fishing wisdom remember you can't catch them if you don't have a hook in the water always trust your instincts and the last one you'll just have to keep listening stay tight everybody <laughs> dude thank you so thank much you. that was fucking awesome great job <laughs> Oh man, I'm glad it worked out. The mic was all right. I was staring at my own face. The whole Everything's thing. good. We t- we timed it perfectly. There's like a couple little spots, but George will be able to handle it, no problem. Yeah. Awesome. You guys rock. If anything else, you give me a shout. Well, do right, man. Have Thank a good day. We'll much. talk to you later. All right, later, guys. See ya. Thank you very much for tuning in to the Sea Rose Fishing Podcast. If you would like more information about today's guest, our episode, and show sponsors, or if you want to order hats and apparel, please visit our website at seabrosfishing.com. You can also stay up to date in all the latest Seabros Fishing content and podcast episodes by following us on Instagram at Seabros Fishing. Finally, to book a trip with us through our family-run charter fishing company, please visit massbayguides.com or see our latest updates and fishing reports by following Mass Bay Guides on Instagram and Facebook.